right, thank you. Yeah, so uh, we're gonna do something a little different. So I need you. To, I need to give you a sense of what to expect. So this is going to be about moral AI, uh, which is a phrase that is slightly different from, say, AI ethics. So it's not going to be about AI ethics in the sense that usually when we talk about AI ethics, we, we mean something like which should be the ethics of the people who develop and design the AI. AI ethics is more about uh, the ethics of the professionals who create AI and what kind of risk they should be aware of, what kind of concern they should have about their work. So today, uh, it's going to be about moral AI, which is more about psychology. It's going to be a lot of psychology, actually, because moral AI uh, means that people, everyone, people are going to have to adjust their moral psychology to this new universe where AI becomes a player. I'm going to explain in a minute, but you, up until these days, moral psychology was kind of limited in scope. Suddenly, we introduce a new class of entity that disrupts the moral thinking of people, and they have to find new ways to think morally. All right? OK. So this is going to be about people more than machines. Moral psychology, and again, it's good that I am a psychologist to give the lecture, but it's also good that not a single one of you is a psychologist. That means you're all on equal footing. Whatever thought you have, whatever question you have is gonna be interesting and helpful for everyone else because you're all starting from the st same state. So please just interrupt me. I mean, there's a ton of material, but if I'm being honest, like the last part of the talk is maybe not as developed <laughs> as the beginning. So it's perfectly okay if we spend more time on the beginning. And, you know, I think it's important that you ask your questions. All right. So I'm not going to define what morality is or what moral psychology is because, you know, it would take ages to converge on something satisfying, but there is at least one big thing that moral context, moral decisions have in common, which is that you have one person, we call that person the agent. So the agent is making a decision to behave in a certain way. And the consequences of that action matter according to the preference of another person, and we'll call that person the patient. Okay. So the agent is doing something, and the consequences of that thing matters according to the preference of a patient. It's not a sufficient condition for something to be moralized, for something to be a moral context of decision, because if we're uh, in uh, the elevator together, and I fart, that goes against your preferences. But it would be a bit harsh to call me immoral for doing this, right? So not a, not a sufficient condition, but it's usually a necessary condition for something to be moralized. That versus dynamics with agent doing something, consequences uh, affecting the patient. And for a very, very long time, moral psychology involved three possible kinds of agents or patients, people, animals, and spirits. Don't think too much about the spirits part. We're not going to need it unless you really, really at some point want me to speak about that. But essentially, uh, the agent and the patient in moral psychology, you can have any combination of these three as agent and patients. Now, most of the time, we think of morality as some human doing something that affects another human. But we can also have situations where an animal does something to a human. For example, if my dog bites your kid, we're in a moralized situation, even though the agent is an animal. I mean, in many, many places in the course of human history and still today, the moral situation is that the human agent does something that a spirit does not like. For example, they're gods. 
and it's a moral situation. Because maybe this action doesn't have bad consequences for another human patient, but the consequences of my action matters for this weird kind of agent, which is God or a spirit. So you could have all the combination of this. And now we're witnessing something really interesting, which is that we're introducing a new kind of agent or patient, which is AI. What I mean by this, that nowadays, and increasingly, people are going to be in situation where the agent making the decision that affects them, for example, is not a human or, or some animal or some spirit, but just software, some intelligent machines. And sometimes people are going to do things that affect machines. And that might be a weird thing, a weird thought, but I think we're going to turn back to this tomorrow. So how I'm going to organize this is we're going to do this in three parts. So first, we're going to consider a situation where the machine is the agent. The machine is making the decision or doing a certain thing that affects the outcomes of humans. And essentially, we're going to see whether people like this or not, what they expect, what they fear, how they make sense of that situation. So. Um, I hope we can finish at least this part today. Uh, then we're going to look at the machines as moral patient, which is, again, some kind of new field where the big question is usually, do people cooperate with machines the same way they cooperate with humans? When I am in a cooperation with another human, I need what we call other regarding preferences which means that I have preferences over the outcomes of another person. I can be antisocial, and I like when other people hurt, or I can be pro-social, and I like when other people are happy. So in cooperation, usually I need some level of other regarding preference. And we're going to ask the question, do people have machine regarding preferences? Do they actually show prosociality to machine? Do they cooperate with machines in prisoners' dilemmas? Things like this. And in the end, uh, we're going to see something that is even more new, which is the issue of machine as moral proxies, by which I mean you have two humans engaged in a moral interaction. And one of them, or maybe the two of them, are sending a machine as their proxy and representative in the situation. So they withdraw from the situation, for example, and they send an intelligent machine to act or uh, be affected instead of them in the interaction. OK? So we're moving into machine as moral agents. And we're going to start with a simpler situation, which is machines are as implicit moral agents. OK, I don't want you I want you to look at the funny picture yet. So we're going to make this distinction today which is kind of useful, between implicit and explicit moral agents. So an explicit moral agent needs to know about morality when making its decision. Because for making the decision, it needs to explicitly balance some moral values or priorities and to try to find perhaps a trade-off between those moral values. So explicit moral agents need to know something about moral values, what they are, how to weight them. Implicit moral agents do not need or consider moral values when they make their decisions. But they can create harm, essentially when they make mistakes. And because their, their behavior can create harm to humans, we consider them as moral agents, but implicit moral agents, because they were not trying to make a moral decision. They were basically trying to do their jobs. And it so happens that if they fail at their jobs, people get hurt. So this is a very big class of situations. And essentially, every time you 
ask some AI system to make a decision with high stakes for people, and the system makes a wrong decision, you create harm, and that's an implicit moral agent. So medical AI can make a wrong diagnosis. That means you're not going to get the good treatment. The self-driving cars can fail to detect a pedestrian and crash into them. Uh, a recommendation algorithm can lead your kid step by step to some horrific violent video. Or, you know, you're at, you're at the airport and some face recognition system mistakes you from a known terrorist. All these are just mistakes, but the stakes are high enough that the mistakes create harm, and so we're in a moral situation. So because, basically, the moral considerations here is just about the mistakes, that means that for implicit moral agent, people are really going to care about performance. Essentially, this is why I'm saying this is the simplest case that we start with, because here we don't have like a big moral complexity. The real moral issue for people is, you know, what kind of performance can I expect from these machines? Or what kind of performance do I request to accept that the machine is deployed? So a very basic question here is that when people can be uh, impacted by the mistakes of an implicit moral agent, how much mistakes are they going to allow the machines to do? So the question is people ask a lot from machines. They expect incredible performance from machines before they're deployed in case the mistakes are harmful. And this is often because the lo their logic is it would be madness to deploy the machines instead of a human if the machine does worse than the human. So I want the machine to be at least as good as a human. But the problem is people often completely underestimate the performance of humans. And because you know they're starting from this illusory level of human performance and they think, mm, and I want a machine to be like, okay, better than this. They end up with insane expectations of what should be required from the machine to be deployed. So I'm gonna give you a couple of examples. So here, <laughs> references on the slides in case you wanna access the slides later and you wanna find some papers you know, to have the details, so, but I'm just going to give you the broad strokes of some papers. I'm gonna start with one of mine. So the idea, oops, was just to measure the kind of performance people expect from automated driving. Like before they're willing to let the car drive and be inside the car, you know, what kind of risk reduction do they want? So I'm sure everyone has heard the magic number, like self-driving cars are going to eliminate 90% of crashes. Yeah? No, never? Okay, because it's been floating around for years. It's basically the first number you see in papers about automated driving. First number is automated driving is expected to ultimately eliminate 90% of crashes. And you might wonder, so how, how, how is that even computed? Where does that come from? Basically the number come from the fact that 90% of crashes are attributed to human mistake. So the driver was drunk, was sleepy, was distracted. That, that created, that creates 90% of the accidents, crashes, sorry. And that means that because the machine is not gonna be sleepy or drunk or distracted, well, we can eliminate all these collisions. Of course, there are issues, for example, about the fact that uh, when the cause of the crash cannot be actually established, by default, it goes into the human mistake box. Which means that 90, it's like 90% of collisions are either caused by human mistakes or happen for causes unknown. All right, so, 
sorry, got distracted. All right, so, so the question is, imagine that we could not eliminate 90% of crashes, that's not gonna happen, but one number that seems to be a bit more realistic would be 25%. So imagine that after, like we're not there yet, but at some point automate fully level five autonomous driving can decrease the number of crashes by, uh, no, can, can eliminate 25% of crashes. I mean, that sounds good to me, right? It's like huge net benefit. Problem is at the collective level, it's good, but what about the individual level? Think about this. So the automated car is eliminating 25% of crashes, and we're gonna rephrase that as the automated car is safer, is 25% safer than, well, the average human driver. Because that's what it means, right? Almost. Bear with me. So ask yourself a question, is it good for me is it a safety benefit for me to switch to a self-driving car that eliminates 25% of crashes? Well, it depends on how good I am at the driver, how safe I am. So ask yourself the question, if everyone drove like you do, what would be the reduction in crashes? Because maybe you're a really, really good driver. And actually, if everyone would drive like you, there would be a 50% reduction in crashes because that's how safe you are. And I'm sure there are people like this, right? I mean, professional drivers, like race drivers. So before you switch to a self-driving car, you have to believe that you will have a safety benefit by switching, which means that your driving is worse than that. That, for example, you might say, okay, I'm like better than an average driver. If everyone would drive like me, we would probably eliminate 10% of crashes. So the car is actually a better driver than me. So I'm switching. Okay, you see me coming here? <laughs> you see me coming? So everyone is asking themselves, hmm, what is my, you know, what is my level of safety? And everyone thinks they're incredibly safe as a driver. So if you overestimate the safety of your driving, then you conclude the car is just not, is just not for you. It's a bad idea. And so what we did was pretty simply, I'm gonna tell you the story in picture. So this is the distribution. Uh, when we ask people the question, if everyone would drive like you, what would be the reduction in car crashes? I can see, these are quartiles. <laughs> so the median is around 75% of crashes would be eliminated if everyone would drive like me, 75%. And what I, what I find even more am amusing is that you see all this distribution is like I'm splitting the sample. So that's everyone. Oh, by the way, this is like a national representative sample of 2000 Americans, but it works in other countries the same. So this is the whole sample. And here I'm splitting, you know, by education, by age, by gender. And the thing is, it doesn't matter. The distribution is essentially the same everywhere. So it doesn't matter if you're old or young, if you're educated or not, if you're a man or a woman. On median, you think 75% of crashes would be eliminated. So this are, no here, I'm showing you the people who think that 10% of crashes, oh, that like zero to 10% of crashes would be eliminated. Oh, by the way, you know, I, I suppose we could have asked people, you know, to give to give us the opposite number. Maybe there are some people who believe that there would be more crashes, you know, but no, no one goes there. Everyone is largely about average. So this is like people would think uh, zero to 10% crashes would be eliminated, 11 to 50. Uh, 50 to 75, and, and so on. 
And this is the number they want to hear before switching to a self-driving car. And you see, I mean, it's pretty simple. You know, people look at how safe they think they are, and they want the car to be safer than they are. Which means that this, like, these people who are very reasonable, who think they are actually average driver, they're happy if the car eliminates 12% of the accidents. But there's no one here. <laughs> no one is there. And then you get into the majority of people, and you get actually into the majority of the population who actually wants the car to be 90% safer than the average driver. This is never going to happen. All right. That was a very long example to illustrate a simple point that people's expectations about the error rate of machines are completely out, completely wacko uh, because they start with a completely wacko reference point about human performance. Yes. Yeah, and then people tell you, no, I would uh, then not. Uh, oh, you mean if 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 there was a man, if we completely forbid human driving, well, in that case we have no choice, right? Instead of maybe taking the bus, but yeah, there's uh, there's a really really low approval rate for that. We could, on average, but then that means you're in posing a safety uh, a safety loss on some people because again the car maybe can eliminate 20 percent of the accident but there are, there are people who are much safer than this so is it really ethical to actually force them to be in a vehicle that is less safe as they are i don't think it is eh. Think carefully before you disagree with this because <laughs> this is a very slippery slope man all right. Yep. Uh, just a quick question about the distribution thing. Uh, do we find the same distributions on other issues than dark record? Because to me, it's oh, even... smart that is smart. So how funny are that is smart? I mean, I don't know because I feel like a, a car crash is kind of a rare incident in someone's life. So if you never had any car crashes, you're likely to say, "Okay, I've never been in a car crash." Exactly. So... No, I think this is. For car crashes, this is a very likely mechanism. The fact that you know I'm a Bayesian and I've never been in a car crash, I think the median distance uh, for the average person between two car crashes is something like uh, 15 years. So if you've been driving for less than 15 years and you've never been in a car crash, yeah, yeah, well, that's highly probable, yeah. But uh, you no know, time is ticking. You know? <laughs> it's going to come soon, but. Yes, exactly. People have so few observation of car crashes involving themselves that you know, they, they exactly, we don't know. But it's still true that it's a very general phenomenon for every quality. I think it's simplified here, but the same, yeah, it, 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 it's for, it works for everything. Maybe not as strongly as that. I think there was like this uh, high school uh, survey of, uh, I don't remember, millions of high school students uh, Asking them if they thought they had their leadership skills were higher or lower than average. Can you guess how many of them said that their skills were higher than average? 95. <laughs> but then, you know, okay, they're students. They were young and naive. And then university professor were asked whether their teaching skills were higher or lower than the average of university professors, 95%. <laughs> so really, this is so hard to actually calibrate. All right, yeah? Okay, I'm gonna skip the second example. Yeah. The response rate? We had 2,000, it was a, a rep sample of 2,000 Americans, 200 American respondents. But there are how many people that did not respond? No one. What do you mean? Some people just refused to respond to questions. So that's oh, yeah. So it's. It, 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 
No, it, it's like neglectable, actually. We had to replace a little bit, but it was uh, mostly neglectable. I mean, we paid them, you know. <laughs> and it's a very quick way to make $5. Uh, all right. So I'm not going to go for this one because the figure is uh, horrible. But basically, this is uh, German participants. And they sort of estimated the performance of human and AI, uh, what they thought was currently the performance of human and AI at uh, in four domains, credit default, uh, criminal justice, hiring, and health. And the story is essentially that uh, people expect something like 20 to 30% error rates in these domains, which is actually an underestimation, at least for the specific task that were used in that uh, survey. Uh, and uh, because they start with this crazy thinking that currently, for example, humans only make 20% mistakes, they want the AI to make 5% mistakes, something like this. I'm not going for this, it's the same, same idea. Okay, this one I like. So this one I like, it's about uh, a very specific example. You have this skin lesion, uh, you need to have it checked uh, by, by a professional, well, by a doctor. Uh, do you want a human doctor to look at it? Or do you want uh, an AI just to do vision stuff on it and classify it? And the trick is that they ask people how much they think they understand how the AI work and how much they think they understand how the human doctor works. So this is their subjective feeling of understanding what's going on with the algorithm and what's going on in the brain of the human doctor. And they get some kind of quizzes, which is the fun part, because they tell you how much they think they understand, no, you ask them questions. Right. So these are standardized, uh, these are a standardized score, but basically, uh, this is the objective understanding. It's not zero. This is standardized. Basically, what the only thing you have to uh, realize here is that people do have some understanding objectively of what the algorithm is doing or what the human doctor is doing. It's, it's very poor, but they, have, they do have some intuitions. And these intuitions are poor, and they're the same for human and AI. Their level of understanding is essentially the same. But when you look at their subjective feeling, they vastly underestimate their understanding of the AI, and that they vastly overestimate their understanding of the doctor. So I call that the mirror box problem, because we all know about the black box problem, right? The algorithm is a black box. I cannot see inside, and you know, I don't know how it produces what it produces. With humans, I think we have the mirror box. That is, you cannot see inside the other human. It's as opaque as the black box algorithm. But instead of being, being painted in black, the human is being painted in mirror. So when you look at the human, you see yourself. And you think, yeah, yeah, I understand. But no, you're not. It's completely opaque too. Of course, I don't understand how doctors look at skin lesion and the kind of reasoning that they have. Of course not. Not more than I understand how the computer vision algorithm works. Or I have basically the same understanding of both, which is basically first and second slide intuitions you know, in a medical talk or an AI talk. And because People think they understand the human and think they don't understand the AI, they don't trust the AI, and they really want a, the human doctor to treat them. Another reason to like in medical AI is that one reason people don't like uh, being diagnosed by AI is that they think they're too special, that their uh, biology, their medical profile and configuration and life history is so particular, 
So unlike any other human, that only a human can take into account this complexity, which is funny at like so many different levels. I mean, I'm not gonna unpack the joke. Uh, all right. So, so far we're looking at the simple thing, which is number of mistakes. And the message was people want really, really high performance for AI because they start with a flowed reference point. But uh, it's not only the number of mistakes that matter, morally speaking, it's also the location of the mistakes. So it means that it depends, the number of mistakes is not enough, you have to understand which group is more likely to be the victim of the mistakes. What I mean by that is that you can have disparate impact. So credit scoring algorithm, for example, might make the same number of mistakes about women and men, but they might actually be too conservative with women in terms of credit score and too generous with men. Or they can actually make no mistakes for men and more mistakes for women. That's disparate impact. So self-driving car uh, might not have the same detection capacity for all road users. See what I mean? So the self-driving car might be very good at avoiding crashes with other cars, but not as good as avoiding crashes with cyclists. So we don't only care about the number of crashes that a car is gonna have, we also care about the victims of those crashes. Are the victim of the crashes localized into a subgroup that is actually already vulnerable? Probation algorithm or face recognition is less good with non-white faces. And probation algorithm, it's a very, very uh, known, well, famous case. Probation algorithm in the US are biased against black defendants. In this case, it's really uh, an interesting case that it's not that they make more mistakes with black defendants. The mistake rate is uh, at parity for white and black defendants. But basically, okay, so you know what I'm talking about with probation algorithm or not? Okay, so the judge is, is making a decision to release the defendant before trial or to keep the defendant in jail. And the algorithm gives a prediction about the risk score of letting that people, that person free. So basically, uh, in a very, very famous ProPublica news article, the journalists were able to analyze the data of Compass, the most used algorithm for doing this, and they realized that the number of mistakes of Compass was the same rate for black and white defendant, but that the mistakes for the white defendant were on the generous side, letting them free too often, and the mistakes for the black defendant were on the conservative side, putting them in jail too often. So same number of mistakes, but very different mistakes. So that's just to illustrate that we cannot just look at the number of mistakes. We have to look at who's, uh, who's exactly is harmed by the mistake. Okay. So when people think about this, the common and main discourse is we're training algorithms on human decisions. Human decisions are biased. So the machine is going to learn the biases. If I'm developing an algorithm to make you know, salary offers to people I'm hiring, and I'm training the algorithm on current salaries for different jobs, chances are the algorithm is going to learn that it should pay women less than men. And will then make the offer. So the concern is typically that if you train the algorithm on human decisions which are biased, the algorithm is just gonna learn those biases and it's gonna legitimate them because no return into the black box. It's gonna scale them up and legitimate them. So we're gonna get back to this, but I just wanna make one point first, which is that in this discourse, there is one assumption, which is that the algorithms are going to inherit the human biases, but also the difficulty in fixing them. Because when we think about biased humans, the problem is not only that the humans are biased, the problem is that they're very hard to fix. Like imagine you're in the criminal justice system in the US and you see that there's one specific judge whose decision seems to be kind of biased, racially biased. What are you gonna do? 
tell the judge, please make an effort to be less racist. <laughs> I mean, imagine the judge is going to say, how dare you? I'm the law. I'm speaking the law. I'm making fair decisions. And you say, okay, fine. <laughs> you say that. He can do anything. I mean, even with HR doing the hiring, you can tell people, okay, you know, it's been 10 years now that we're trying to hire more women at the econ department. Oh, we still, we're still failing, but we're trying so hard. It's very difficult to fix humans. And so when people say that the algorithms are, learn, are going to learn the biases for humans, uh, the, the thing is, maybe it's not that bad, because at least we can fix the machines. We can look at the distribution. We can feed them with a lot of simulated cases. We can try to tweak them so that in simulation, we get the, de the, the desired results. Many, many smart people are working about how to achieve fairness, you know, by algorithmic fairness. So we can do this. But I'm a psychologist, and I'm telling you, we've never so far found a single way to do this with humans. So in a way, I prefer a word of fixable bias machines than unfixable humans. All right, end of digression. Uh, so. Because remember, we're doing psychology. So the question here is, when people hear these stories about bias algorithms scaling up the, bi the social biases, how do they react? What kind of fairness do they want? What, is, what, what do we have to give them so that they're satisfied by the fairness of the algorithmic decision? Well, you know what? My job is just that. You, know, you you want to know what people think is fair. You show them different outcomes, uh, different algorithmic behaviors. We call that the treatment. You show them different treatments, and you ask them which one they like the best. The problem when you look at this literature is that because apparently no one can agree on the definition of fairness, the experiments are all over the place. Seriously, this is not even ex an exhaustive exercise. I looked like at a dozen of papers that were like doing behavioral experiments about algorithmic fairness. And these are all the different ways people have to operationalize fairness. I mean, some of them, I, I'm sure some of them know, well, statistical parity, false positive parity, false negative parity. These are all things that, you know, could be desirable. And then you have like really exotic stuff. Pose vicious cycle. Privacy rights is there too. I don't even know why you're getting into privacy rights for algorithmic fairness. But anyway, the point is, I would love to be able to tell you something about the kind of fairness people expect from AI. But at the moment, I think it's entirely impossible to say anything because people are trying 5,000 different methods to assess what the kind of fairness people want, and nothing is comparable. I mean, even when there's some kind of comparability between experiments, the results don't even seem to go in the same place. So for example, uh, if, you're, uh, if you're considering university admission by algorithm, it seems that people want demographic parity, which is just to say, I'm doing university admission. You know, how do I know my algorithm is fair? And people will say, OK, what's the admission rate in your university? 10%? OK, so we want that number to be a constant, whichever way you split the sample of applicants. If the admission rate is 10%, we want you know, the admission rate to be 10% for women, 10% for men, 10% for each ethnic group. This paper is actually really funny because the author are so disappointed. They have like six increasingly complex definitions of algorithmic fairness that they tell people. And then they actually write, okay, so I can't remember the phrase. Like people seem to prefer a simplistic definition of fairness. Like we have all these wonderful mathematical tools and those stupid people, they want demographic parity. 
which is so crude. You know? And so even when we actually try to explain to them the other methods, or we, we actually try to do the computations for them. So I, I was imagining this mathematical researchers you know, <laughs> begging their subject, no, but look, 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 I know it sounds complicated, but it's actually really cool. Okay. <laughs> you see, I'm going <laughs> to, and trying to do this on the blackboard to convince people that there was a better definition, but those stupid people, they wanted demographic parity. Okay, so, uh, but the thing is, you do different situations and you find different rules that people like, uh, like equal false positive rates in a uh, criminal justice system, or something like calibrating furna calibrated furnace uh, when banks are making loans. Uh, I'm not getting into the definition. You have the papers if you want. But uh, there's no consistency in methods in that domain. And even when the methods are broadly consistent, there's no consistency across domain of applications. So I think it's the Wild West at the moment. And yeah, I'm bitching a little bit on that slide uh, about the fact that it's mostly computer scientists who try to do these experiments. And you know, it's a training to do experiments. And sometimes when computer scientists try to do these things, they are a little bit naive about the way you have to frame experiments, the way you have to present information to people in order not to nudge them into a direction or to confuse them and so on. So bring in a psychologist next time. Uh, you wanna, it seems that we're doing breaks at 45 minutes. You want one? Yeah? All right, we take one. So I want to make one last point about uh, fairness and the kind of fairness people want or how worried they are about algorithmic fairness. There's this thing going on at the moment, a uh, few papers that all seem to go into the same direction, which is to show something that I'm ten tempted to call the vulnerability paradox. And it goes that way. It seems that the groups of people who are actually at risk, who we think are at risk of being discriminated against by this bias, because they're already being discriminated against by humans, it seems that these groups are the most willing to let AI make the decision. See, it goes opposite to the discourse because the elite discourse is, oh my God, the machines are going to learn the biases and it's gonna harm people who are currently already being discriminated. But you ask the people being discriminated, and I think you get the intuition. They'll say, well, we know how bad it is. We have like firsthand experience of how bad it is at the moment. So you know why? Let's take a chance with AI. Can it really be worse? So I don't know if that is what's going on, but I want to show you a couple of studies I know of. Uh, also, to try to nuance how big this is. Right. This is something that's happening, but it's not like a story where every discriminated group would be like super excited about AI. It's just like a differential willingness to let AI make the decision. So, so this one, uh, we're like vignette, hypothetical st situations. So you have a group of uh, participants who can either be white or BIPOC, black, indigenous, and other person of colors. And uh, they were told about the racial disparities in COVID-19 death during the pandemics, the fact that white people were, were less likely to die. And they were uh, told, all the participants, white and BIPOC, that the disparity in, in death in the, the ethnic groups was more like, was kind of likely biases in human, in human doctors. Like diagnosis, like black patients, for example, being underdiagnosed or the gravity of the, the symptoms being not recognized. So the typical pattern and the one we're gonna find in all the three examples that I'm gonna show is that White participants don't want the algorithm. They want a human doctor. And they don't care if there is a racial disparity, current racial disparity in deaths. They want a human doctor. For BIPOC participants, if they don't know 
that the disparity is co probably caused by racial bias in doctors, they don't want AI to the same level as white participants. But as soon as they get informed that the biases in human doctors are a probable cause of the, of the death disparity, then they get more likely to uh, take a chance with AI. But here you can see it's the percentage of participants who are willing to let an AI doctor diagnose them. And in any case, when I'm saying that BIPOC participants seem to be more likely to accept an AI doctor when they hear about the human bias, it's still like 30 to 35%. So by no means they become a majority one AI doctors. There's like a slight move in acceptance, a slight upward tech in the acceptance of AI doctors, but it's certainly not going to turn into a majority. And by, by the way, exactly the same thing happened in the same context of COVID-19 death. If you look at uh, Singapore instead of the US and social economic class instead of ethnic group. Yeah. It's just like, basically this one is the only one that is higher than all the others. Yeah. I mean, they, I mean, here we're just showing that these things are different, but it's also, yeah. Exactly. And I think it's a bit forced to actually tell people, and do you know that the disparity in death is actually due to racial bias by white doctors? It, it seems like a bit in your face. Uh, we want you to really understand that. So uh, this is why I'm thinking the studies I'm gonna show you here, I think they're very interesting evidence that we might wanna look at this vulnerability paradox, but I don't think it's kind of established yet. Too much noise, exactly. Too, too many variation in what people think of. Right. So, uh, so same thing happened uh, oh my God. Okay, you know what? Basically the same thing happened with hiring. And I don't think actually I should spend too much time on the other example. Okay, just this one maybe. So uh, this was a general survey of uh, cyclists and motorcyclists about automated driving. And uh, basically, uh, cyclists and motorcyclists are the most uh, endangered group on the road. Uh, sometimes cyclists are tied with pedestrians. But if you look at your likelihood of dying per minute you spend on the road, uh, this is scary high if you're in, uh, on a motorbike. So scary, scary that my son is never going to get one ever because really it's it's terrifying and then cyclist is still like very very high sometimes times with pedestrian compared to, to a car so if you're in a car your, your risk of dying per minute is kind of neglectable it's everyone else who's not in the car without risk and i think it's safe to say that uh, cyclists know about this that very perfectly know that they're the vulnerable group and that uh, human drivers tend to not completely pay attention to their safety. So the thing is, uh, this vulnerable group, cyclists and motorcyclists, express 40 to 50% more trust in automated vehicles when it comes to their own safety. That is, again, you might think, okay, the car is going to be trained on human data. Like uh, uh, on every Tesla, you have this shadow mode that is observing what the human driver is doing to feed you know, the learning. So basically, some of these cars are going to be trained on what humans do on the road. Oh, presumably, they're going to do a little better. So you might some some people might be worried that it means that motorcyclists and cyclists will be at even more risk. 
But actually, cyclists and motorcyclists seems to be a bit optimistic and think that automated, automated driving is going to be good for them. Now, I don't know if that's true. Uh, I'm kind of uncomfortable. Because what do you do when the group that is supposed to be vulnerable to the deployment of the machine tells you that they actually want a machine to be deployed? You know, do you say, well, you know best. You have first-hand experience. You know what it is. So maybe you're right, right? And I don't know. Or do you act in a patronizing way and tell people, no, you don't understand? You're really you're ignorant. You don't understand the risk. You don't understand the math. So trust me, you know you're going to be harmed. I don't know. Okay, enough with this. Because now we're moving to like more foreign stuff. Because so far we've been considering implicit moral agents, right? So the machine was trying to do its job, but it was not trying to balance moral considerations. So you did not have to teach the machine about morality. And now we're moving to explicit moral agents where you actually have to make choices, where you actually have to tell the machine something about moral values and human morality. Oh, no. <laughs> no, we have to do something before. OK. All right, very quick. I'm going to summarize this part, OK? So, so oops. All right, generally speaking, if you describe uh, to people a situation when a human made, made a mistake that created harm, and you describe to other people the same situation, but then uh, the machine made the mistake and not a human, then people are going to react more negatively to the machine mistake. OK, fine, right? People are more angry when a machine is harming a human through mistakes than they are when a human does that. Sort of something like, you know, we know that humans have some variance in performance, uh, machines should be held to a higher bar. OK, nothing weird here. But the funny thing is what happens when the machine and the human make the mistake together. Right? When they make the same mistake separately, people blame the machine more. But when they make the same mistake together, oops, then people start blaming the human more. And like the very classic uh, frame for this is uh, crashes that involve a, a, an automated vehicle and a human safety driver. So if you want a story first, I mean, gee, I need to focus here. OK. Uh, remember the uh, Uber crash in Arizona? So a, uh, an Uber car was equipped with self-driving technology and was running autonomously with a safety driver ready to intervene. And it collided into a pedestrian and killed her. That was a really big, really big event for automated driving. It was, a, it was the first time a car killed a pedestrian while in autonomous mode. So the way the story unfolded, you know, okay, everyone heard about that. Self-driving car just killed a human pedestrian. Then the first thing we heard was, yeah, but you know, this pedestrian, she was uh, crossing a highway at night without reflective uh, clothing while under the influence of drugs. So first reaction to that was, yeah, okay, uh, maybe she has some responsibility in what happened. Okay. Then... We sort of very slowly, we heard about the car. And we heard like things which were very alarming. Like, okay, it seemed the car had issues detecting the pedestrian. It took a little while, but actually the detection was performed in time to break. But for some reason, Uber had decided to disable the uh, autonomous braking. So the car was not allowed to brake autonomously. And they disabled uh, the signal that the car should send to the human. 
apparently because it was uh, too disruptive to the testing process because there were too many false positives. Like the core was so conservative that it would break all the time in an emergency. And so it was dangerous like for other people on the road and very disruptive to the test. So they kind of relaxed. They, 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 they removed some option for the car to break autonomously. And so the thing is, that means that they were relying on the safety driver to be ready to intervene. And then it was the last layer when we heard after some kind of investigation that uh, the safety driver had been looking at the voice on their phone for the last 40 minutes instead of watching the road. So in a situation like that, you know, it's extremely complicated. You have humans doing foolish things and the car really not behaving as it should behave. So the question is, when you have this kind of joint production of a mistake, how do people allocate the blame? And the answer is that, remember, while when the machine and the human made the same mistake separately, people blame the machine. When the human and the machine produce a mistake together, people blame the human. And apparently, because it's just easier. You know, when I tell you that story about someone crossing the road at night on a highway while dragged, it's very easy to understand why it is such a big mistake. Very easy for us to interpret that. Whereas, you know, the behavior of the car, the technical capacities of the car, how it was trained, that's much more complicated, actually. So it's something like cognitively much easier to blame the human because we understand human mistakes more than we understand machine mistakes. Okay. All right. Moving on, moving on, moving on. Okay, maybe we have that. Okay. So let's look at machine as explicit moral agents now. So the machine, that means the machine is trying to solve a moral dilemma. There is a conflict of values. So typically in practice, that means for some kind of scarce resource allocation problem. So the machine has to allocate a resource and the person, the humans who are deprioritized face uh, dire consequences. So in the case of self-driving cars, that means that you have safety to distribute. And that, for example, sometimes you, you may have to decide between two crashes. You know, you either, either you crash into the pedestrians or you run off the cliff and you kill your, your passenger. So you have to distribute life. And you have to prioritize who's going who's gonna to live and who's going to die. Uh, kidney allocation uh, algorithms do that all the time. You know, deciding who's going to get the kidney first. <coughs> so this, in these situations, you have conflict of values. What should be the priority uh, between humans that want access to the same resource, especially your life and death resource? And so what people say most of the time is that you should seek value alignment. That's the magic word. Magic phrase is value alignment, which is that if a machine has to perform an explicit moral decision, balancing moral value, then we should teach the machine the same values that we human use. I mean, not rocket science, right? As an idea. Like if the machine is gonna make autonomous moral decision, balancing moral values, then we should seek value alignment so that it does it the same way we do. All right. But the problem is that once you've said that, you get into so many complications. But first, why do you even want to do this? I mean, you might consider that value alignment is a good in and of itself. That it is, it is intrinsically good for machines' values to be aligned to human values. Uh, so our case study is going to be self-driving cars. So in this example, this self-driving car is uh, about to run and crash in this family. And the only option to not crash and kill this family is to go and crash into this concrete obstacle, but that's gonna endanger the life of the passengers who happen to be a pregnant woman and her son. And so the question is, in a situation like that, what should the self-driving car do? Kill the family, kill the passengers. If you ask uh, car companies about this, you always get a response like, 
we will implement the legal framework and what is deemed to be socially acceptable. This is like typical boilerplate that you get from car companies. You know, we need to know what society wants. We're gonna do uh, what people uh, want us to do. We're gonna do value alignment. And if someone is interested, I'll tell you what happened before they had to say that. Because one of their executives make a very, very, very dangerous remark in a magazine. And they had like three days to come with something less explosive than he said. Okay, so maybe this is it's just desirable to do value and alignment, but you can also have other goals. One reason you wanna do value alignment is well, simply that you wanna sell the product. So you say, Value alignment can help with consumer adoption because of the ethical opt-out problem. What is the ethical opt-out problem is that if I'm selling you a self-driving car and I'm telling you that, uh, sorry, it's gonna kill you if it has to avoid the dog on the road. This is the way it's programmed. Well, you think, no, that's not my values. So I'm not gonna use that car. So one reason to do value alignment is to sell the product, but in that case, you have to align with the values of the consumers, the people who are going to buy or not your product. So, I mean, that could be academic, right? Because if you're thinking of self-driving cars, you might think, okay, how is it programmed in situation where he has to kill me or someone else? I mean, frankly, that's like a Z-order problem. Uh, there are many, many other issues that are more important when I want to buy a self-driving car. It's like, how many times is it going to crash or you know, things like this? Uh, is it going to protect my the privacy of my electronic communication? Is it safe from cyber hacking? You, know, you might have a lot of other issues that are more pressing that what the car is going to do in the very, 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 very incredibly rare case where it has to make a choice between your safety and that of someone else. But recent data here, I'm showing you how people rate the importance of various legal, technical, and ethical aspects in their decision to buy a self-driving car. So data, this is this like data privacy hacking is like an eight. Uh, you have things like how, how good it, it, it performs when you are to an inner city environment. So you see the importance of these things. You know what this one is? The big one? The one that people say is the most important for them. Is it going to kill me or the pedestrian? I, the most important thing for people, the most important feature of their decision to switch to automatic driving is what the car is going to do if it has to decide between two accidents. And you know what? I, I think I'm responsible for that. That, that I, I, I really, really feel so bad about it. Because I don't know, probably you don't even know who I am, but I'm the guy who put that problem on the map. I'm the guy who introduced the word to this pedestrian or passenger dilemma in self-driving cars, and it blew up so big. Like it was on all the newspaper in the world, and I think I've created this thing. That 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 people no think it's like the big issue, and I don't know what to do. Because <laughs> it's not like I can go back to every newspaper and TV show and say, you know what, forget what I said. I think we, you, you misunderstood. It's not that important. Many, many other things are more important. But the problem is, okay, we're there. People think it's super important. So you have to do value alignment. Even if it's an incredibly rare use case, you have to tell them what the car is going to do. All right. Okay, I'm skipping this. So, uh, of course, if you're going to do value alignment, uh, you can try to align to the value of consumers, but that's for adoption. But sometimes you have to also align to the value of non-consumers. Why? Because sometimes you also have to worry about the acceptability of the tech by non-consumers. So in our example with the cars, that means that if your only goal is to sell the cars, then you can only care about the values of your potential consumers, people who are gonna buy the cars. But if you're also worried about people protesting in the streets about your technology, you also have to 
kind of aligned to the value of the pedestrians and the cyclists and the parents who are walking with their kids through the neighborhood where the cars are. Because the, because the passengers of the cars are not the only stakeholders. So you have to go broader and to ask a broader share of the population uh, what they want. So already that's complicated, right? Because now you have to interrogate the whole societies instead of a very specific subgroup of consumers. And the problem is uh, values are not even consistent across cultures. So if you want to do value alignment, you have to look at the value of different subgroups within one country, say. But what you learn about the values of one country does not necessarily tell you what's going to happen in the next country. So value alignment always, always requires the question, whose value am I, 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 am I aligning with? And still in the context of the cars, when we were faced with this problem that, okay, we need to understand the values of a whole range of people, and we don't even know if the values are going to be the same in every country, we decided to, well, collect the preferences and the values of people across every country in the world. And we designed this thing uh, called the moral machine. Everyone has heard about it. Is it something that some of you know about or not? Can you tell me if you know about this? Okay, lots of people don't. Oh, oh no, yeah, no, lots of people do. Okay, uh, but very briefly, what we did was to design the website and the website is generating scenarios where a car is, uh, is gonna sacrifice, for example, uh, the passengers or the pedestrians. Sometimes it's a choice between two groups of pedestrians and uh, there can be like uh, green or red lights and about 20 different characters of different age and gender and other things. So we create these scenarios and the database of scenarios is huge. We have millions of them because the combinatorial explodes when you're making groups of one to five characters drawn from a population of 20 possible characters, the structural things about, you know, are other people in the car, is there a green light or red light and things like that, it explodes. So we had this huge database of scenarios and we created this website. You can go to the website and the website is going to throw choices at you. And you just decide what the car should do every time. It was a very big uh, viral success. Uh, thanks to uh, mostly, I think, YouTubers. We didn't expect that, but uh, essentially the one feature of the moral machine, I think that made it viral, was that because we have this huge data set of scenarios, whenever you go to the moral machine, you will get a different sequence of very different scenarios. No one will have something remotely similar, which meant that people on YouTube could start doing reaction videos because it's different for every time. And so people starting to do these reaction videos where they were playing the moral machine in real time, reacting to the scenarios, sharing with the viewers and YouTube and Twitch and whatever. And because it's, people seem to like that, everyone starting doing their reaction video. I think there are thousands of them uh, only on YouTube. And some of them, like when PewDiePie did his, this one got like, I don't know, 20, 30 million views. So, yeah, this was my opportunity to learn about a lot of people. And who is PewDiePie? <laughs> who is that person? <laughs> what kind of name is that? <laughs> Markiplier? <laughs> people, Jack Septicai? Do you even know who these people are? <laughs> right, okay, I didn't. <laughs> uh, so, um, I have somewhere uh, a cut up a montage of reaction videos. If you want, I can show you that at some point. But I have a three minute selection of the kind of pe thing people say or do when they do the moral machine. All right, but I have to rush maybe. And um, But if you want to see the, the, the video, I can show you tomorrow, okay? So we did this thing and it was very big and we got like many, many data. At this point, we have about 100 million uh, data points which is uh, we, uh, in total, people judge 100 million of these scenarios. Sample size is about 10 million individuals because of course people do several choices. So sample size at this, at this moment is about 10 million yeah, individuals. 
from every country on the planet. So, but at the time where we published the findings, we only had 40 million data points. Uh, and this is where people come from. So, of course, you can see there are lots of white spaces uh, in places like Africa or Australia, or, but basically you could map this onto energy consumption or, you know, uh, or electricity consumption, and basically you would get the same map. There is a lot of those white spaces where we don't have subjects are actually places where no one really is or very few people live. So, but that said, we still could do a lot better with Africa and it's better enough. So we got all this uh, data and what we did that because we were interested in nine uh, dimensions, nine moral values, if you want, we could compute for every country a vector of uh, the vector of values on these nine moral dimensions that people use when they make these choices. And we use the clustering algorithm to make, well, little bundles of countries. So the clustering algorithm does not know where the countries are. The, the clustering is done only on the basis of the moral, the vector of moral values. But when you do this, very interestingly, of course, you see like big geographical clustering. So essentially, we found that there were three big clusters in the world with different kinds of moral vectors, uh, the Western or the Global West, the Southern Hemisphere, and the Eastern cluster, where you have East Asia and Muslim countries. So uh, I know we have uh, very little time, so I'm just going to give you a few pointers about this. So this is like the big Western cluster. And within this big Western cluster, you have like subcluster, right, of countries which are uh, even more similar to each other. So this one here, I'm going to read. This little subcluster here is United Kingdom, Australia, New Zealand, Ireland, United States, Canada, South Africa. It is insane. All the former British colonies respond exactly the same. And I mean, and it's not like a simple scale, uh, I agree on a 1.7. It's like a very complex vector extracted from millions of, of you know, conjoint choices about what a self care should do in very complicated accidents. But when you look at responses like the British Empire, apparently is completely homogeneous. Uh, I there are some that like this one. This is... Uh, Switzerland, Germany, Norway, Denmark, Netherlands, Finland, Luxembourg, Austria, Iceland, Sweden. Common point? Protestantism. All the Protestant countries are bunched with one another and separate from Catholic Europe. This, this here. All right. Uh, Southern, okay. The Southern, what we call the Southern cluster is interesting because there are like really two groups in this cluster. So we call it Southern because of this, because here we got essentially all of South America and countries uh, from the Southern Hemisphere, islands. And then with that, there is this little subcluster. And I remember when uh, I received the results of the analysis, my co-authors, I'm the only French person on the team. So my co-authors were saying, you know what, there must be a problem because we've got a cluster that is completely meaningless here. So what is the common point between, sorry, I have to do that on my screen. What's the common point between Martinique, New Caledonia, Reunion, Polynesia, Algeria, Morocco, and France? <laughs> Zero sense, right? <laughs> actually, yeah. Actually, I know what's going on here. So even there, so you got like the British Empire is here and you got the French colonies or ex colonies there. <laughs> we cannot be more opposite. <laughs> no, France, France is here. France, that's France and all like former colonies and overseas territories. There, again, there. UK, here. So, uh, of course, once we've done the, I'm just telling you there are, there are like three blocks 
our free cultural blocks in terms of these moral vectors, but I've not told you what they are. And I'm not really gonna do this, explain what are the differences because it's complicated. Uh, it's not like there is a simple story of, uh, yeah, Asia does this and Europe does that. No, it's like, uh, it's, it's a polyfactorial difference. So what, so here we have the nine dimension we're interested in. And so I'm drawing the moral profile of the three blocks according to this nine dimension. So this is the Western hemisphere. And you see this circle, this black circle here. Uh, this is the um, global average value. So I'm standardizing the profile so that this circle here means the average value in the world. So the Western hemisphere basically maps onto the global average of the world simply because it's so big. It's so big that the responses of the West define what is the global average. They draw, they attract the global average. So this is not interesting. What is interesting is to see how the two other blocks deviate from this global average that is uh, defined by the West. And you get interesting things like, for example, here, uh, this is the Eastern cluster. So uh, East Asia and uh, the, the Muslim Middle East. For example, in this cultural cluster, older people pay a much lower penalty for being old. Which means that in the West, people just kill the old to save the kids. Very, very strong tendency. It's even higher in France that you know, older pedestrians or passenger pay a very big penalty. They're gonna be killed to save kids. It's not true to the same extent in Eastern and Muslim country. That's not to say that people in the Eastern and Muslim country prefer to save the grandfather and kill the baby. Every country in the world prefer to save younger people to older people. The direction is universal. It's just the strength of the value that varies. And so it is minimal in Muslim and Eastern countries, maximal in the West, but always in the same direction. And that's true of many other things here, which I'm not gonna go to. Uh, no, I am, I am not going to go into the homeless character. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna take a couple of questions and then we're gonna slate, okay? Yep. 